put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. I still know what you did last summer. Movie review. That is such a dumb title and it didn't need to be. I still know what you did summer of, I don't know, 90, 97. When is the first movie exactly? I mean, it starts one year and then it goes to one year later. Does that mean that the start was 97? Or is it set when it came out, which, you know, 97? So, know what you did in uh, summer 96 anyway yeah it, it could be that you know both this and the the next sequel I'll always know you know the next one is about something else so it's fine that that's called what you did last summer but then it's called I'll always know it's not always gonna be last summer or does the fisherman now have the ability to stop time yeah, I, I feel like it, this is something that could very easily be resolved. This is where we start going downhill. But I maintain that there this, this movie can be fun. Anyway, it is yet again, you know, almost, the fourth, we, we are approaching the 4th of July. It is the day for the US of A to say, yeah. If, if you're one of the people who like watch that and are like, this is so offensive to British people, you're a moron. It's clearly mocking Americans' sense of, you know, how, you know, what is it, you know, like, that thing of destiny, you know, Manifest Destiny, how America is the best, you know, and here's why they're so much better than Britain, and everything in it is all this petty stuff, and, show, you know, we've got the BBC, America, so, you know, we can't even handle that you have a channel that we don't. How How is British Broadcasting, what was it, channel or something, British Broadcasting Channel, America, just, you know, anyway, full stop. We are in Boston. Julie is doing what she can to avoid going back to Southport, a port town in the south. We are now left with the two survivors, and they are no longer together, despite the, the ending of the first one. Julie is in college in Boston and Ray remains in Southport still working on you know the the fishing boat and in case you you know the the events of the first one a, a brief recap the the two couples you know, celebrate the 4th of July, and then by being complete idiots, they hit a guy, you know, in, in the street going up. It, it's just like, now that, you know, in the first one, it would be spoilers to say, but in this one, given that it's a sequel, and those were the events of the first one, it would have been pretty easy to avoid running someone over. Okay, the I, I get that, you know, the jock who I think I'm sorry Ryan Felipe is too pretty to be a jock I, I buy him as the rich kid I do not buy him as the jock he's both in that movie anyway he's like you know ah, oh, you can't drive my car at all oh, what is this music on the radio and he you know somehow very swiftly switches it to like rock and cranks the volume like crazy I, I don't know if he's like 
you know, did, did they even have like settings? Wouldn't you have to like turn some knobs back, you know, 90, 97 with, with car radios back then? Anyway, he does that really quickly, you know, practically jumps through the, the was it, sunroof kind of thing in, in this ridiculous expensive car. And, you know, it's like going, woo, and, okay. And, and you know, like, the, the liquor gets, like, you know, all over the car. And Ray is like, ah, you know, trying to, you know, you just re reflex if, if something, if, you know, you're, something's, like, spilling over you, you try to, like, get, you know, to avoid it spilling on you. Here's how I would handle it if I were Ray. Pull over, you know, slow down, pull over, and tell Jock, Barry, here's how this is going to work. We're going to drive slowly, defensively, and you aren't going to distract me with, with loudness or, you know, acting like a jackass. Or, you're going to get out of the car, we're going to drive home, and then we will call you a taxi. That's how this, you know, that, you would have it's, you completely avoided the events of these two movies. Anyway, finishing off the recap, you know, Ben Willis survives being run over, being dumped into the water. He comes back a year later, patient one, that Ben, and the, you know, he, he works on, first he stalks them, then he kills them, and, you know, yeah, by the, the end of the film, his hand has been, you know, lopped off, I suppose is the, the way to put it, and he was thrown into the water, and... In this, we find that they they never did find the body, and yeah, it's we are yet again approaching an anniversary for the yeah. So Julie's of course worried that he is still out there and that he will strike soon, given that it's approaching the anniversary. However, in spite of that. Somehow, she is much more calm and, you know, happy in this film because that's easier to make attractive. You know, the first one, it's in part Kevin Williamson, you know, the when you watch a slasher, you expect everyone, you know, they're, they're like attractive and like, you know, having fun because that's more fun to watch, basically. You know, it's, so when you, when you watch the first one and you see these, you know, four attractive people, and they're always, like, broody, and, like, worried, and scared, and, like, you know, they're, they're not really having much fun. That's less sexy, so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, playing with conventions of the, the slasher. Anyway, she has a new, you know, black friend, and she is even sassier, and in more of the film. She wins a contest, the, the friend, Carla, she wins a contest, radio contest, to, you know, four tickets to the Bahamas. When they get there, they find that it isn't quite as nice as they had hoped. Nevertheless, it's, you know, it's safe. There are, like, tons of people. It's, it's comfortable and it is quite isolated and in spite of it maybe not sounding so at first it is a solid setting for a Hollywood summer teen slasher the the reason why there aren't a lot of people at the resort there is a reason but it's pretty silly. And then 
once again, someone starts leaving messages. Someone is stalking them, wearing a rain slicker, carrying a hook, or perhaps now having a hook for a hand as it goes in the urban legend. And yes, this is, you know, once again, someone knows what Julie did. In the summer of 98, I'm going with that. It's, it's just the, the title's too dumb. And it's at this point that we have to wonder, why is he killing, like, you know, just people around Julian Ray now? In the first one, it made sense. The four of them were all in the car. You know, any, any one of them, they all made the decision. You know, after running him over, they didn't go to the police. They dumped him in the water and left him for dead. You can understand why the guy wants revenge for that. And yeah, there were targets of opportunity in the first one. There were, there were kills that he chose to make because it would make it easier to kill the others. You know, maybe, maybe a family member, maybe, yeah, you know. But he didn't go out of his way to just kill just absolutely anyone. I mean, watch the first film. There are plenty of people that he could, you know. Yeah, you know, again, I, the film itself spoils the first one. So, dude doesn't really go after parents, for example. Those are, like, loved ones. And, you know, he's, he's, he has a mission in the first one. And in this, yeah, he's just kind of killing people around, you know, gotta, gotta get that body count up, and it, it just, it seems like he could just wait for the two to be isolated, instead of, yeah, killing a bunch of people around them, and yeah, and of course, at first, Ben Willis is not taken seriously, if it is him, who, whoever stalks them is not taken seriously. They think Julie might be crazy, not, you know, they don't believe her, because otherwise the film would be a lot shorter. The first one, a lot of the drive was them solving the mystery. Who did we kill? And, you know, who is trying to get revenge for us killing? that person, you know, that makes it, you know, that gives it a nice continuous drive, you know, not, not all slashers have that kind of thing of, this is what we're going for. A, a lot of them, it is just, you know, here are some, here are some young people, here's a slasher killer, and let's watch, you know, we, we secretly placed a slasher killer within the lives of these young people. Let's see what happens. And, yeah, in this one, that mystery is solved, and we're just waiting for them to get around to dealing with the stalker. Now, the... There really is not particularly a story here it's just which again you know it's not that's not new for a, for a slasher and you know you you have to wonder why Julie would ever lower her guard again you know I mean scream gives you the answer to this tag team that sucker never be alone always you know, be together with a friend, someone you can trust, watch each other. I mean, they do do that for some of this, but, yeah, substantially less than they they could. And, you know, still, in this, they do genuinely fight back, and, you know, they, they've been driven to that point. This is basically the only thing I know by this director, except for his Judge Dredd. I understand why people hate that movie. 
I personally like it fine. I, basically, the the big thing about that is that it it really doesn't follow the tone of the yeah of the source material of the comics and. I can completely understand hating for that, but it's a fun film. The, the you know the the Schneider is substantially less obnoxious than he could be. It actually does retain some satire. Yeah, I mean if you just it has stuff from the comics, and there, you know, some of them are in the basic direction of the original I mean when when you when you look at you know like pre MCU comic book adaptations yeah other than the the stuff where it really doesn't do what the comics do it's not a bad film you know and yeah a lot of a lot of films from back then were really bad With this, you you genuinely really miss Kevin Williamson. You know the the constant winking at the audience, the you know pointing out these are very much the you know these are our character stereotypes and just the the way they relate to one another right off the bat. You know, I rewatched it just yesterday to you know, remind myself of everything about it for the purposes of this review, and yeah, it's really, I, I almost feel like I undersold it in my review of that. It, it really is very nicely written. This is, you know, obviously Scream is the, the better, the, the more satirical, and yeah, this movie very much lives down to the, the kind of stuff that Scream makes fun of. And, you know, some have noted it's almost a parody of itself. And given that it is playing it fairly straight, it's less forgiving the coincidences and the ridiculous feats by the, the fishermen. And they do really get, like, it, there's some in the first, but this one goes nuts with it. There are a ton of things that are just, how? And the, 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 this is very much the typical bad horror slasher sequel kind of thing. And it's far too similar to the first one. It's incredibly formulaic, and the ending twist is absolutely ridiculous. I I forget if it was like IMDb or Wiki, Rotten Tomatoes, or what, but somewhere I read that you know someone wrote that like, oh, this sequel has almost none of the same cast, or you know, it's it's set in a different place. It has the survivors of the first. I mean, I understand saying that for the third movie, but this. Others have noted this is a lot like Halloween H2O. The. As, as I was saying, the. You know, I understand saying for the third film that, you know, because that genuinely is, and that's not, you know, a spoiler at all. That really does not have the cast, or it, it barely has a connection to these first two. But, you know, for, for that I understand. But for this, it has the survivors of the first one. And, yeah, it's in a new place because, you know, it might be might not be that interesting to have it in the, the same place. It's just... Yeah, I, I, I did. Did you, did you expect like Rob Zombie's Halloween to? I mean, that resurrects people that were, you know, that died in the first movie. So, yeah. I 
I should start by saying the characters in this do tend to be likable. There are very there there are almost no characters in this where you're just like okay that guy is just yeah there's basically there's one guy where you're like I wish that character wasn't in the movie. Other than that, sometimes they're like a kind of jerks, but that is that is it. It doesn't, you know, genuine, genuinely and generally, they are likable, and that is a big deal for a slasher. That, you know, very much not always the case. I, I remember, I, I want to say it's like a documentary on the Friday the 13th series, and it's like a producer or something said, well, it would just be too depressing to watch the whole movie, you know, all these teens getting killed if they weren't obnoxious. I just... Yeah, I I can I guess I can understand that way of thinking, but I don't want to be sitting and watching a movie where I'm cheering on the the killer. You know, I, I'll admit there are a few films where that's enjoyable. I I'm with Spoonie. That shouldn't be called horror. I just there there are movies where you can be like I can't wait for that guy to die. They're called action movies. It's, you know, there you can have really obnoxious characters on, you know, the villain's side, and you can be looking forward for the good guy to kill. I mean, that's, I, I expect to get to the Matrix trilogy, re-reviewing them in, you know, not too terribly long from now. When you, I, I will especially say it of the first film, when you watch the first film, you hate Smith. You, you know, Agent Smith, just, you, you hate this guy. It's, it's fun to, it's, it's the kind of character, it's the kind of bad guy character that you love to hate, and you can't wait to see when, you know, you, you want to see him be defeated at the hands of one of the heroes. That's how you do it. But a movie where the majority of the characters are awful, and you're kind of hoping for someone to kill them, that just doesn't sit right with me. And not even only because it's kind of an ugly way to look at a piece of fiction. I mean, to be fair, it is these are fictional characters, not real people, but nevertheless, when 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 human beings look at other human beings, kind of, you know, part of what we, we do then is to kind of empathize, you know, I, I don't know, maybe they were making them for Republicans. Anyway, with all that said, in this one, like I said, the, the best friend is black, it's, you know, is again black and is in much more of the movie. The, the first one, Julie does have a, you know, college roommate best friend. Yeah, yeah, I think they are. They, they are friends at the very least. She's in like 30 seconds of the film or something, just getting her to leave you know, the college so she can go home to Southport. And in this, you know, she doesn't go home to Southport, and that's not a spoiler, she goes to the Bahamas instead with the black friend. Which means, and, and she brings her boyfriend, of course, makes sense, which means we now have two major African-American characters, and without Kevin Williamson's writing, we get really obnoxious stereotypes. And I want to make clear, I, you know, some of my best friends were black. I, I have no problem with black people. I actually, even with how, you know, obnoxious the stereotype, I still could kind of enjoy them. But, yeah, it's still very much, again, this is the kind of thing where I'm almost certain that Scream 2 yeah, Scream 2 definitely came out before this. I don't know if it came out before or after the first of these, but in that, in the opening, we have kind of obnoxious black stereotypes, and the film is making fun of that trope. Here, the film is living down to that trope, but yeah, so just, you know, if that's the kind of thing that really bothers you, yeah. And, I mean, I say, I, I realize that it's not, it's not good writing. It's really stereotypical. You know, she's sassy, he's randy and really aggressive. Like, 
you know, when, when you really look at, like, today, some of the way in major motion pictures, black people, you know, are portrayed as human beings. Back then, just, you know, if you had a black guy in a movie, he was probably less really angry and just, you know, scary kind of thing. It just, seriously, deal with your issues. And don't do it through your your scripts and your your films. It's 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 a little scary that you're that you're so obsessed with the idea that that black people are like I mean they're they're like killing their former slave masters and they're like golly gee they're they're dangerous man. Anyway, there are some really great creepy sinister like middle-aged to older men you know played by Bill Cobbs and old favorite for horror films Jeffrey Combs you know always always love seeing him be like sinister in every moment of his performance he doesn't even have that huge of a role in this but every moment he's on screen like the first time you see him you know they're in this pretty empty resort and they're like using the, the the bell to get you know and he's like the director of the the resort and you know Carla's like ringing on it where, where is he ringing on it and then he I think might be the first thing you even see of his appearance is you know her hand is on the ringer having just you know pressing on and he puts his hand on her hand and she like yanks hers away and he pulls away the ring and he stares at them and you know then he he's told you know oh we you know we won the we won the competition and he's like roll out the red carpet and just and and later he's like i knew from the second i saw you i knew that you were going to be trouble and just yeah he's just he's so good and he's of course playing you know like like I said, Julie isn't taken, you know, Julie and the Fisherman aren't really taken seriously at first. So he's, of course, part of that. You know, it, there, there isn't really a, a sheriff in this. So he's, he is the, the disbelieving sheriff in the horror movie, you know. And, yeah. And again, it's, it's the kind of thing, if, if you watch this and you aren't, if, you, if you're watching this and you're not just thinking, I'm going to have fun with this. It will really annoy you. It is very, it, yeah, the, the stereotypes are very much there. And, yeah, and again, it's playing it so very straight. There's, there's, a lot of it is played without any hint of irony. And we yet again have pretty people looking pretty, and their problems end up seeming like pretty people problems. And... In the first one, that was at least somewhat tempered. In the first one, it was mainly they cast pretty people, and what they're wearing could sometimes somewhat accentuate, even though they're like running around, you know, they're they're like sad and like scared all the time. So they're not like dressing to, you know, stun others, but Still, it, you know, they were still, you know, relatively attractive. In this, yeah, the characters are pretty much always attractive. And it's, I mean, Jennifer Love Hewitt, very much our protagonist, is sexualized all the time, regardless of the situation. She's, like, always in a push-up role, always, there's always cleavage, you know, during the day when she goes to bed. Not only on this vacation trip, you know, she'll show off her bare legs. Maybe she'll get wet from something and, you know, maybe she'll be bouncing around and just, you know, I mean, at least the first one had that, you know, kind of throwaway line about, you know, about not objectifying Sarah Michelle Gellar's character because she's like in, you know, the, the first movie is genuinely, you know, again, it's, it's making fun of all these tropes. So what's... It's pretty much the first thing you see in the first movie because you're you're sitting down and you know all the guys in the audience are like we're gonna see some babes and the movie literally opens 
with, you know, it's it's not the very first thing you see, but it's basically the second thing you see. Like, two minutes of the movie have passed. I won't give away exactly what the first thing you see in the first movie is. It's it's too good to give away. Two minutes have passed, then you see a literal beauty pageant. Like, yeah, you're going to see babes. Here's, like, I don't know, half a dozen, maybe more, lined up. Go ahead and gawk, you know, and right after that, Jim Flo, you know, b both of the guys are like whooping and like, you know, and she's like, guys, I'm already on sexist overload here. Could you cut the commentary? And just right there, you know, Kevin Williamson in action. And yeah, in this, it's completely without a hint of irony. It's just constantly, I, I really feel bad for her, the, the, you know, and, and people act like, uh, you know, she's, that's all she is. I, Jennifer Love Hewitt has shown she can be rather talented. And, you know, it's not like, I, I mean, I don't know if it was like something that was decided, you know, because they had her you know, in the lead or if it was that she asked for it. But regardless, you know, incredibly attractive young woman, but it it doesn't, yeah, it's, it's really obvious how it's constantly sexualizing her, and whether, you know, whoever made that exact decision, it remains that the decision was made because that's part of how, you know, it's, it's almost expected of women, and it's, you know, a way to, like, show if she's successful, then she looks attractive, or if she's attractive, then we expect her to become successful. It's, you know, it's not as though, I mean, there are things about this movie that you can, like, like I said, I find the, the depiction of black people to be a bit troublesome, but the fact that she's sexualized, that doesn't, like, that doesn't reflect negatively on her as a person, I would say, you know. It's, it's a thin line to walk, you know, realizing that this kind of sexualizing is, you know, obviously it is wrong, but it's not her. It's not like she's, you know, doing this awful thing when she, you know, it's, yeah, I, I feel like I've pretty well covered it. And much like the first, you know, it, it feels like a perfume ad more than a horror film at times. And, you know, some might say, well, you know, they're, they're attractive women. You, you can't help but make them look attractive. Jennifer Esposito is in this. To, to be fair, she's not made to look like not. Yeah, this this in this one, it's pretty much every every attractive person is constantly looking attractive. But nevertheless, it's clear that you know Jennifer Esposito is made to be a little creepy, at least you know. So they do know how to not make you know they they're aware that they're doing it. They're they're not accidentally doing it to every single female in the you know. And there's the the cleaning lady is also not objectified one way or another, which is actually nice because she, you know, you maybe expect her to look like, you know, ah, oh, she's just a cleaning lady, she's probably not very attractive or whatever, and it really doesn't have any, you know, anyway. And in the first one, you know, I mean, you've got Anne Heche, incredibly beautiful woman, not at all you know, and she's she's decidedly creepy. She's never really, you know, particularly trying to. Be, they they make her all pale, and you know, the her performance, you know. So clearly, they they are able to not make every single, you know, woman look anyway. Much like the first one, it is at least equal opportunity. There's at least one cute and one hot girl and guy, and I mean, in this, like, in the first, in, in my review of the first one, I, I jested that maybe one of the guys will get a shower scene. In this, it, it's, you know, not a spoiler, they're, they're on an island resort, there's a pool, everybody 
has a you know a scene where they get all like half naked and wet so that's yeah and the you know yet again I mean scream has very attractive people as well but they look like you know actual people they they're not constantly looking like they're you know in a photo shoot or going out on a date and uh, you know unfortunately this one does not have the class awareness that the first one not not particularly and we again you know these really aren't particularly interesting characters but the acting is again good including from brandy and i i don't you know i mean she is as far as i understand mainly a singer so you know you would and it's not like they put her in the movie because they you know she's in the movie she's a singer and that's why she's in the movie you know they they cast her because the teenage girls would be more likely to go to a movie that had not one but two you know female pop singers so you know and who knows maybe one of them will maybe at least one of them will get to sing and look at that they have albums out i guess that you you know these these things happen you, you coincidence and you know unlike a lot of other slashers the women in this you know not you know not only the the you know the the female you know the the female virgin survivor girl the women in this are smart you know they, they you know julie's you know the, the women in this are all strong characters julie is again you know remarkably smart it, it's said very early on that she's like you know one of the she's like on the dean's list and like it's you know she's doing incredibly well at this college and you know carla clearly does want the you know she wants julie to be happy she wants julie to you know have us have success she's maybe a little pushy about it and she's not necessarily always right but she clearly she's coming from the right place you know and again that's a lot of slashers at least some of the women are like these really frustrating again you know these filmmakers trying to work out their frustrations because you know maybe when they were in high school some of the girls didn't want to talk to them and they're like well well then i'm gonna make you look really bad in a movie and then i'm gonna enjoy writing your death scene and yeah this this is why you know wes craven was reluctant to to do scream one and it's it's incredibly good that he did decide to do it once again, rest in peace. What? Watch Scream One, Two, and Four. At least you. Three is. You know, it's it's watchable enough, but definitely One, Two, and Four. Man does amazing. Did amazing work. Well, possibly does. I I, you know, I don't know for sure about an, an afterlife and you know artistic expression, creative expression in the afterlife. I don't really know these actors from much else but you know I respect that some of them have you know done better elsewhere this can be really tense and suspenseful and like Scream you know it is an R rating it has an R rating and it earns it you know not you know, not not really with nudity. That wasn't really a thing in this. But this was before horror tended to be PG thirteen. You know, and yeah, so it's it's blood and violence. There is some gore. I I wouldn't say it's it's too much. So, and you know, this the you know all really memorable like kills, attacks you know chase scenes stalking sequences you know it's yeah it's 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 just it's a ton of fun in in that regard again it's not the the way i see it we're not enjoying that these people are like 
afraid and getting hurt and such. But we it's it's cathartic for us because we're worried like it could happen to us. We could be attacked by you know someone with a sharp instrument and who just wants to to you know attack us, kill us. And yeah, when we see you know again someone that has been humanized to us you know, suffer that fate, then that's a way that we can live out that that fear in a safe environment, you know. And as such, it's important that the characters are likable and that, yeah, that it's well-crafted. It's, you know, it's the kind of film that actually shows this kind of, you know, they're, they're, don't get me wrong, there are, you know, incredible horror films that barely show anything, but those are for a different kind of, this is for the very kind of visceral, you know, like, because, yeah, some of us actually think, you know, oh, what, was, what if someone came after me with that kind of weapon and attacked me, you know, stabbed me or something, and then seeing someone stabbed in fiction where it's okay, then, yeah, and it's, it's, very creepy. This is much dumber, but also somewhat more fun as a guilty pleasure than the first one. You know, we're no longer like looking at maybe more thriller than horror. This is through and through a slasher flick, and yeah, and it's it's just it's a really fun one of the you know so, some slashers are almost like apologetic, like, oh man, I wish I wasn't doing this, and in this, yeah, it's it's fun, like, like I said, Judge Dredd, the, the, Danny, Danny Cannon, I want to say, the man can, can make you have fun with something that's not necessarily the smartest thing in the world, which, again, there is some satire in that first Judge Dredd movie, and it is fairly, you know, it's surprisingly smartly done for the yeah, but the you know the the scares aren't all jump scares, but this will make you jump out of your seat. And yeah, it is you know it's all about the scares, and there's you know the the body count is much higher than the first. Maybe it reaches double digits, and you know. Again, the, the you know Scream is obviously the the Scream movies are obviously better, but yeah, this I find this more fun as a you know as as a guilty pleasure kind of thing. And you know, I already mentioned that the attacks and such are you know really memorable. They're also very nicely aggressive in this, much more so than the first. And the hook is used really well, and so are like other sharp instruments, and they like cut very easily through flesh. Th this was before flesh was like in in you know horror and action, like just apparently you know barely like like wet paper, like it just comes apart at nothing. But nevertheless. You know the the sharp instruments still do go right through flesh very easily, and the hook somehow can be used very effectively for stabbing. And it's like intellectually, I know that this is completely unrealistic, but just viscerally, it's just it's so much fun to watch. And it's again, it's very well made. The the you know, the angles, the editing, the score, which again, a lot of slashers, you know, maybe they were being pushed, you know, maybe they were being, maybe they were rushed, maybe the, the people in charge didn't really know how to make a good movie, and they just focused on putting out something that, you know, well, people will watch it, of course they will, and yeah, in this, again, it's a dumb film, but it is well made. They they did put effort into actually, yeah. And the you know it it gets the job done. You can watch it more than once. And there are some clever elements to it, but yeah, it's it's derivative, bland, uninspired, and quite dumb. 
it has been noted that you know there's almost a Hitchcockian kind of feel to the the island you know kind of Bates Motel kind of feeling to the resort and that's very nicely done the film is a little too eager to tell us how to feel rather than you know earning that and there's definitely too much screaming and I, I you know th these weapons of course also have that nice sound you know kind of you know it always sounds sharp and so, and you know some people are like ah oh, it's it shouldn't really make that sound do you want to believe that it's insanely sharp or don't you it's just i why are you complaining about this it's just if you know it's it's fiction it's supposed to be enjoyable and stimulating it's it's not a documentary it doesn't have to reflect reality particularly you know and the movie is very tight and very you know just you know the the scares come quickly and plentifully and the movie is 92 minutes not counting the end credits and 97 if you do count them and you know with the whole fisherman theme it is of course you know the the water doesn't necessarily feel safe which you know I've, I've just started replaying Prince of Persia's Sands of Time you know it befitting the the setting of ancient Persia water is always completely safe to drink somehow you know it doesn't matter if it's like you know if it's like coming out of a, a drinking you know okay sure but you know they're like you go through baths and there's like you know you can be walking through the water you may have to stand in the water in order to drink it prince will still happily you know you know pick up some of the water in his hands drink it right there i mean it's see-through it's clear obviously it's safe to drink I mean, even if like he's going to this otherworldly place that gives him like deja vu and like every time he drinks from this fountain it like you know his eyes go all you know and it's just it's it's wild and then he wakes up and it's like wait the room that I was just where's the where's the portal to it you know it was like a hole in the wall before and every time he goes there he still does you know gotta love that that mentality as far as you know, d drinking water. Maybe they were also just more their their you know constitution was sufficiently strong that you know they they didn't get too sick from it. But yeah, yeah, that was a bit of a stretch for this video. I like talking about Prince of Persia. I've read other parts of this franchise. The links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.